morning, everybody. Um, we're seeing this as a work session. So if we had long sleeves to roll up, we would do that right now and just say this is really for all of us uh, to talk through. But we have the great pleasure of having Jenny and then Tanya give their version of their universe. And in the case of Jenny, it's that she has worked her way to having a specific beat, which is a young children ECD beat. And in Tanya's case, more of the term enterprise reporting, yet she was here a year ago, so she's going to be able to report out from the front of what it's like to have all this rattling around in her brain over the last year and what's come of that. But first, we need some guidance from you. And that's just a sense, hand raised strongly so we can see, how many of you consider yourselves beat reporters? And if you don't use the term beat, you might say a specific topic or section, but you basically have a constraint in that the world is not any topic you wish, it's a specific topic. That's what the US term for beat is. So just raise them high as we see. Two. Okay, and can you, those of you raising your hands, can you just shout out what your beats are, what you focus on? Health and science? Okay, so health, health and science, human rights, economics, or we call it, okay. Okay, great. So we have the majority of the room then has pretty much open season, general reporting or editing. Okay. That's, that's really helpful. And then those of you who have a beat, do you have, um, actually, let me make this to everybody. Does any of you, do any of you feel that you have any resistance at the current time if or when you have suggested a topic that fits into the focus of what we're doing this week? I see one head being nodded over here. Do you raise your hands if you feel like you have strong resistance. Okay. Um, are the mics around anywhere? Great. Just because then the remarks that are made up here can be more useful to know what form that resistance takes. So um, whoever would like to just two words or three words on, on what that's like. Um, uh, so uh, yesterday when we went out looking for uh, uh, child-friendly spaces, I realized that there are very few green spaces in the city I live in, and even then, uh, parents don't really let children just go there. So if I pitch a story like that, uh, that is considered to be the beat of a civic reporter, so I would not get to do it. So that is the resistance okay. that I would face. Okay, great. So not, oh, we don't like that story, but that's someone else's story. Yes. Okay. Did you feel like you had any resistance? Yeah, the co oh, the sorry, coming yeah, to you now. I agree with her. It's the constraint of the beat that doesn't allow you to uh, write the the kind of stories that you think of, even if it's a good idea and there is no systemic opposition to the idea itself. Okay, great, thank you. I'm sorry, just the mic's gonna come right to you right now. Yeah. Yes, yeah, just wait one second. Yes, yeah, so it, just to redefine that, resistance means you come up with <coughs> an idea, however you pitch it, email, in person, and you see body language and you hear words that are just not opening the gateway. Yeah. They, <laughs> they just don't want that story. So I found a solution years ago to this. I became a columnist. I worked a lot to become a columnist so that I have that column so I can write whatever I want. I usually report on that column, I, more than opinion pieces. So I, I, you know, I have that space. So other than that, when I do freelancing or reporting, okay, I do whatever they want. But okay, you know, so you've I come up with a solution. Yeah, for myself. Okay, so that's great, and we'll get yeah. back to the. Thank you very much. And one last comment from Anna, Anna Claire. Uh, I found uh, resistance on um, frequency, per periodic, uh, periodicity. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, about oh, we are not talking about this subject every week, or not yeah. talking about the okay. subject every month. And other, the other resistance is about the time I will take to write my story. So, oh, I can't let you do this about five, day, whole, five whole days doing it. No, only one day, and that's it. Okay, great. So just trying to collect all these. Yeah, and um, sometimes it's not hardcore resistance as much as it's just like <coughs> not excitement from, um, you know, from, uh, from people who value like, like politics and, Prisons and criminal justice, and and they want, 
Exactly. So it's like, oh, oh, is this going to be like a feature? And, uh, no, it's not. And, and, and so, you know, you write it or you yeah. don't, and, and maybe they don't get, it doesn't get the support within. Okay, great. So what I hear you saying is the hierarchy of what matters in journalism, and often you feel that yes. around these stories. Okay. Okay. One more comment, and then we'll try to basically soak in what you've said, and then as people speak, we'll try to address them where we can. So it's similar to what she said. So if I do a story like this, they would say that there is no peg to it. We do not have anything going on, which it, it doesn't fit in the context of the narrative. So we'll take it some other time, and it just lies there for months on end, and uh, it doesn't Jane, get published. Uh, can you explain to me? I'm sorry if I'm, I'm not, uh, being like innocent, but what it means for you, a feature? The, because it didn't sound like something cool, and for me, it sounds like something cool. So <laughs> can you explain? It's in the eye of the writer, I would say. Do you, it looks like Anna would like to answer okay. that. It shouldn't be always relegated to so features, it, I guess it, is what so I'm saying. So the feature it's means that it is not hard news. Right. Know? It right. means a news peg that day necessarily. Certainly you might develop a news peg, but it's not an immediate peg like was being spoken about in the earlier session where this has to be on the front page or, okay. or the local front page or that. So thank you, because that really gives teeth to what we're trying to do and share with you now and, and really make this a dialogue. Um, I just wanted to give a, a little feedback from uh, what we've talked about so far that might help overall with the beat. And one of those things was yesterday, Hero, Hero who spoke, he divided the world into this kind of first phase and now we're entering a new phase. And I, I really thought about that last night and I, see, I think that it's true. And so that um, the first <coughs> phase was about this basic science and the basic knowledge, getting it out to everybody. And it feels like we're getting to critical mass there, but just in case, um, when Dr. Burke Harris spoke, about epigenetics, and there were questions later, I really recommend that you look at her chapters on that. She has this very easy to grasp metaphor around music, how written music is, and then maybe what the conductor might write for how you conduct that music. And it's a very easy metaphor to grasp. She really worked on that aspect of the book. So I recommend if there are more questions on epigenetics to take a look at that. I also wanted to mention, I have two minute warning, uh, that um, the concept of the first thousand days. Has anybody heard about first thousand days, right? So there's a lot of stories that can come out of that. And many, many countries have these campaigns going on and they're just that, they're you know, advocacy, what is it? But I've seen a lot of people going out and trying to go back to families throughout the thousand days. So the frequency can be met somewhat in that we get to know a family who's struggling and they're getting interventions and we're following them over a thousand days. So I just want to make sure you know about that. And Frameworks was mentioned yesterday. This is a group that really uses the anthropology to understand public opinion in specific contexts. And when I've gone to a country to report on early childhood, I'll go to them and they'll give me their key people in that country who have fleshed out the frame. So I just wanted to mention that. And so in this new era, Era, though that has to do with that first era of basic science and the new era of quality. That's really what is going on now. We need to look at quality and inclusion. That hasn't been mentioned that much yet, but kids with special needs are still the bottom of the heap in every way, maybe in reporting, certainly in how they're being addressed and in interventions. Um, in the area of quality, there are lots of tools to look at, and one of the things is that any of us who's a parent knows that there's a lot of child development that we don't know ourselves. To be a quality parent, we need to know that science, not the brain science necessarily, some of that, but what we really need to know is what happens at age one, age two, how many words should I be looking for? And every study I've ever seen done in the United States on that shows that most parents have no idea. So if that is included in the reporting, it goes into that heap of, of quality. Um, and so just lastly to mention that funders, there are several in the room, that my perspective on the funders that are in this room and elsewhere in the field is that they literally shape the field. And what's now happening is that World Bank, WHO, um, governments, USAID, you name it, are now really entering the frame. 
but that funders shape this field and they are founts of stories. There's one called Grand Challenges Canada. They do a lot of piloting around the world and there are stories among stories on their website that you can go to looking at the grants that are given. What happened with this? Did this go to scale? Did this not go to scale? Um, uh, so I really recommend you look at the funders both as sources of stories and sources of funds, uh, hopefully. And just ending on the, they also have newsletters, e-newsletters that are helpful. They've set up a lot of these networks around the world. And uh, lastly, this whole idea of emerging leadership. So there was a story in um, the Early Childhood Matters that Joan did that features Bhutan. And the man who wrote that story, there was no early childhood whatsoever there. And he became a global leader. He got to be in a program for a year, got ideas, and now he has gone throughout Bhutan creating early childhood opportunities where they didn't exist, rolling it out for the whole country. And so some of the leadership programs that are going on give you ideas through that frame of solution journalism of people you can follow who are responding to knowing that we have the science, but now what do we do? Um, be happy to help during the story conferences with anything else that can be useful. And over to this woman with a very interesting title for a presentation. Let's see. Thanks very much. It's definitely an honor to be here. Um, so I want to talk about three things. Um, I'm doing a one-year deep dive into early childhood development, young children, whatever we want to call it. Um, and I want to talk about how that came about, um, what it looks like, and then try to give you guys any tools I can from having now, I'm six months in, um, any tools I can to help you jumpstart your own work, um, be it ideas, sources, anything. I do think uh, at the end of this, we should create a Google Doc with just a source list. I think that would be helpful, starting with the sources who are here today and their emails and phone numbers. And I think we should share that. I don't see any reason why we should all be replicating that work. Um, so duping your editors into letting you write ECD stories. Um, how did this, how did it, just before I start this, how did this come about? Um, I, everyone's asked me this question that I've talked to, so I'm just going to answer it. I was at the New York Times for uh, 11 years, and I left because I wanted to cover things that crossed disciplines and crossed countries, and the Times didn't have sort of the bandwidth for that. I wanted to cover learning science um, and how what we're learning about how we learn is being um, transforming schools, so sort of uh, learning of science and future of schools, uh, but I also wanted to address parenting, but in a really, um, really, um, overstating my own competence, um, in a sophisticated way. I didn't want it to be a mommy blog. I wanted to look at, I am a parent, and I found the amount of information overwhelming, but I wanted to do it from a scientific approach. And all of those I thought were interesting globally. I thought they were themes that resonated globally. And the Times is a siloed place. We have bureaus, we have um, beats. For obvious reasons, it's a huge organization. And court said, come build anything you want. And um, <coughs> truth be told, my brother had just died, and I suddenly just didn't care as much about brand and sort of um, the big thing, and I wanted to do the thing that I was most passionate about. I wanted to build this space and kind of build an area. So I did. And, um, and then I got, was approached by the Bernard Van Leer Foundation about a year after I'd done this, because I'd written a few stories in early childhood as part of the um, kind of learning sciences. And they said, would you be interested? We'd like to fund you to do more on this space. And I was kind of like, well, <laughs> sounds like a bribe to me. Like, you can't fund a journalist. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Um, it turns out it actually happens quite a bit. It's a very transparent um, transaction. It, there's a contract. Um, they gave us money. That money has enabled me to travel in a way that I wouldn't be able to do for courts. Um, it's given me cover. ECD stories aren't always hugely um, well read. Um, and so it's given me the cover within my organization to say this is where I'm spending my time and my focus. And we've been funded to do this. Um, Annabelle is my uh, teammate in this. We were able to hire another reporter, so that obviously enables us to put out more content. So that's what the funding's for. It allows me to focus. Um, so instead of, uh, you know, sort of waking up every morning and deciding what I was doing a lot on future of schools, this really focuses me on the ECD. So that's kind of how it came about, and I'm happy to talk to anyone. And uh, I guess a very important piece of this is they have no editorial control. They don't get to decide what I write, um, and I actually have no idea whether they like, <laughs> like it or not. So... Uh, um, but I think the idea is just, I guess they have enough faith in the science that, you know, more is better and, um, I guess hope that I'm, um, okay. So the space we're, uh, we've created is called rewiring childhood. These are the organizing principles we've come up with. Why is there such a huge gap between what we know and what we do? Uh, what does science tell us and what doesn't it tell us? I think we can get oversold on this sometimes. What are countries, companies, cities doing about it? 
um, very much a solutions journalism approach. Um, I think interesting examples from around the world. Um, role of technology in AI, there's actually some really interesting things happening in this space as it relates to parenting, as it re uh, relates to early childhood. Um, and uh, that's obviously more saleable to editors a lot if um, that's an issue. Uh, what's working and what's not, again, a, a solutions approach, and what it's like to be a new mother or a parent everywhere in the world. This is a question that um, Patrick and I talked about when we started. Uh, again, having, I have two kids, they're seven and nine, and I um, found being a new parent incredibly overwhelming, and I'm about as privileged as they come on the planet. So to think about that through the lens of disadvantage, deep poverty, isolation, mental health issues, um, what does that look like? What does it feel like? And what are we doing to support that? Um, those were some of the questions that sort of uh, drove us. So these, I'm going to just put up some headlines to give you a sense of how we've approached it. The science. Um, a groundbreaking study offers undeniable proof that the fight against inequality starts with moms. That's Jamaica. So you heard about that from Sally Grantham McGregor. That's about a 2,000-word feature on Jamaica and Reach Up and how, um, how that study, which its biggest limitation is it was teeny tiny and it, was, it used very, very sophisticated home visitors, but it produced massive effects. And when people in the field, talk, uh, Jamaica is like backhand for what you could do, the range of possibility. And so I needed to understand that study because everyone kept referencing it. So I used that as an opportunity to do it. The only buffer you have is a parent. Take that away and everything else falls apart. That's a quote from Jack Shonkoff from the Center for the Developing Child. That was for a story that Annabelle and I wrote together about um, the child separation policy. The quote was so much better than any headline we could have ever come up with, but that's about toxic stress that the buffer that exists is apparent um, and that we are actively taking that away, which is insane. Um, the emerging devastating evidence that childhood trauma could affect the next generation, that was some research that came out. The free and easy way to help kids develop language skills according to MIT research, fascinating study about serve and return. Um, that interaction that I think you've heard a lot of people talk about, this is, uh, this is if any of you know about the Hart and Risley uh, study, the uh, 30 million word gap that exists between rich and poor kids, this is actually looking at the, what is it? Is it actually the number of words or is it the interaction of the words? And the science is, is, it, the science is emerging and it's fascinating to see. It's actually not the number of words and it's not where it comes from. Words from a TV is different from words from a mother or from a parent. So um, policy, what it's like to have a baby in a country that actually cares about new moms. Um, that's a story about the Netherlands. And I, can't, I still can't say the name. I put the word in the story. There's a uh, Dutch word for what this woman is. It's a nurse midwife that comes to your house for up to three weeks after birth for three to eight hours a day, depending on what's happening after your pregnancy. And she does literally the stuff that, in my dreams, every mother in the world would have. And it's, it goes far beyond sort of teaching you how to nurse or helping you with lactation problems. It's helping you with your other children. That's a massive transition if you have other kids at home. Um, uh, it's laundry. It's cooking. It's making sure that you've um, brushed your teeth and taken a shower. I mean, it's some, it sounds so basic, but it's actually amazing. And I use that as an example of what's possible. Now, n most countries aren't nearly rich enough to do that, but let's put it out there. This is what real support would look like. Um, the incredibly long list of benefits to kids and parents if we took paternity leave seriously. That's from a study from an organization called Promundo, which you should all get to know, which focuses on paternity and on fatherhood and what fatherhood looks like around the world. Um, and this study was just kind of baffling. The list was like, mothers would have better he mental health. Fathers would be more involved in their children's lives. Like, everyone would be happier and the world would be a better place. Um, but of course, that's not where we are. That's just where we think we are. Um, Brazil's, Brazil's audacious plan to fight poverty using neuroscience and parents' love. Um, that's a feature I just finished on Criança Feliz. We've sort of mentioned that a few times here. Um, went to Brazil and looked at this program in five different cities um, that is really trying to put at scale, like at, at massive scale, <laughs> um, all of this into national policy. It's, as I said, World Cup. I know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> What's the score? All right, you might as well tell us since you checked. Everyone wants to know. Uh -oh. um, and we know how to make programs that help poor kids. The hard part is scaling up. That was a Columbia program I talked about m with Marta yesterday. Um, great results after two years. By five years, all of the results had actually gone away. So very important to report what's not working as well as what is and try to get into why it didn't work or what the theories are anyway. Technology, um, that, these are all fairly uh, self-evident, but the, um, 
there are some very interesting uh, technology approaches right now that are trying to, again, if, you're, if your big question is scale, technology is an obvious tool. Of course, everything we're talking about is human interaction. So can technology actually do anything? Unclear. But clearly, it's going to try. And again, I would say from the standpoint, um, Quartz is a very tech-oriented publication. So this is a helpful way of me, for me to intersect um, my slightly off-piste interest of ECD with something that's very natural for Quartz readers. Um, scientific controversy over whether gaming addiction is a disease or a symptom. That was one of Annabelle's stories. And this, is, this was a big uh, topic a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And I think we'll continue, obviously, with Fortnite and everything else forever. Uh, big topic. Um, hitting the news, this is, you know, again, we've talked about this. You can take your lens of where you are and just intersect it. Um, these are all Annabelle stories. Um, and that bottom one did incredibly well. Um, so, again, once you're in that mindset of taking the child approach, the child development approach to a story, sometimes um, it can have good outcomes for readership as well. Um, these are just um, kind of, again, I think you can take a random approach. The second one, this is also Annabelle's story, uh, about uh, very similar to what was being talked about yesterday, how we can transform urban spaces into learning spaces and what active learning looks like um, in urban architecture. Um, so I don't want to spend too much time talking about this, and I'm happy to talk offline with anyone, but I literally think you can combine ECD with any beat you have. So I was a finance reporter for 10 years. I think that there's a great economic story that can be written about this. You can do labor force participation and child care. You can do, um, you know, there's, and there are interesting economists doing work on this. You, I'm sure you know all this. Policy, there's a million directions to go with policy, right? Um, maternity leave, paternity leave, jails, daycare centers. Um, science is fairly obvious, gender, technology, migrants, follow the money stories, you know, abysmal state of care workers. Let's look at actually how much they pay and what that looks like in real terms and whether that's what we want to be doing with the people who are caring for our children. Um, okay, so my other reason for being super into this is I had those and they turned into those and now they look like that. <laughs> and um, I do find that that's, um, it's definitely not my driving reason for doing it, but I think it, um, I think my empathy level for what it takes to um, raise children <laughs> is uh, probably a little bit, in my case, more, um, I'm more aware. And so I think that this is an important beat. I wanted to say one last thing, which is about, again, I was a finance reporter for 10, well, actually a finance reporter for almost 20 years. Um, and, and I think this idea of hard news and soft news is a very interesting one. I think I have always wanted to do what I'm doing now. And so I'm very lucky to have finally gotten there. I think I didn't do it because I didn't think it was hard news. Um, and I think Joan talked about why it is now, because we have neuroscience behind us, and there's an economics case for it. And that's all true. But I also think Anne-Marie Slaughter is very articulate about this idea of a caring economy is a real thing. You know, countries have values and priorities, um, and those are reflected in policy and how they allocate their scarce resources, which is economics. Um, and this is a real thing, and it has real health consequences. I think we can look at loneliness, social isolation, mental health problems all around the world and say there are consequences to not taking care of parents and families and young children. This is, so I'd push back on those editors who, you know, and I get it, and I think I lived it very much, but it is hard news. We just have to be really smart about how we approach it, but we now have tools to do that. You know, we can prove to, we can, we can point to the neuroscientists, we can point to the economists, and we can make our way in. And once you've made your way in, sometimes it opens up a little bit of the space to do that. So with that, I will end. Thank you. They put something for me because I'm too sure, obviously. <laughs> it is sad, but you can laugh. I laugh. I'm happy to know also that I'm not the only one sharing. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I'm going to start with something that we already discussed, uh, the term beat, that for me was like a American journalism slang. So when I received the program, I didn't know what should I talk in this table. Uh, so uh, that is, I, I go very deep on researching <laughs> Wikipedia. So now I know that is the definition that it is on Wikipedia. I didn't know what it is. You know, it's fair enough. And, and then I say, oh, now I get it. Okay, so uh, that, this was like my reaction because uh, I'm, I said, you know, I'm not a big journalist. I cover a lot of topics which I enjoy. I mean, for me, it will be hard to be like some of you having just one area. I couldn't like handle it. 
Um, and, and I mean, I do science, I do even travel topics, you know, so it sounds like kind of schizophrenic, I know that. Uh, and okay, so I wanted to show you some examples of how on different, I mean, it's something similar of what Jenny did. Uh, I work in a, a small, I mean, it is like a weekly publication on my newspaper. It comes out every Saturday. Uh, and it is, uh, its name is Tendencias, which is translated like trends. So it's really broad about the things that we can write, which is very cool for me. Uh, and I'm going to show you some, some examples of the things that I, I have done trying to put ECD and childhood uh, inside of this publication. So because it is in Spanish, I don't know if, if you can get what is the topic of this cover. I mean, it's kind of obvious. <laughs> you know, that's why it helps, you know, always the cover it has to be like really explicit. Uh, so uh, we have in Chile like this huge and maybe a super discuss uh, on Facebook and Twitter between moms, you know, we have like this big trends, you know, like positive discipline and um, longer breastfeeding, and you know, you can now carry your child and they are really expensive uh, bags so you can <laughs> have them. Um, so a lot of moms think that this is too much, you know, that we are, we are actually spoiling kids. And on the other side, there is these moms that are like crazy. I know baby led winning, maybe some of you know that. <laughs> what is that? Uh, so you give uh, to the kids like the, I mean, six month children eating like whole food, no like mash food. Uh, so for some mom is like, this is crazy. You know, he's going to like <laughs> be without air. I don't know. So it sounds like a kind of mundane, uh, maybe light uh, uh, topic, you know, like moms just arguing on Facebook. Uh, but it, it let me address um, some topics, like some science about parenthood, you know, which a longer breastfeeding is good, why that you have your child in your arms, you know, with the help of these bags is actually good for them, and so on. Uh, so it was like, and of course, people were, moms were upset with me <laughs> after this. Uh, so this is like also parenting, but it's also education. This is from another magazine I work that is also from my newspaper. So the translate of this uh, title will be like, Babies on Waiting List. Uh, so I know from one, uh, some, some of the presentations that I have seen that Chile uh, actually has like very good uh, daycare facilities, you know. I didn't know that we were that good between our neighbors. <laughs> but however, uh, it's not enough. And a lot of moms had this issue that they want to go back to work and they can because it is like exactly waiting list and very expensive daycare. Right? It's also yeah, like that here, I know. Uh, so environment. Uh, Santiago is our biggest city and we are more and more lacking of green spaces. Uh, so we try to address that topic. Uh, you know, the title is like, you need more green, like you are missing more green. And we try to see how this uh, is affecting children's development. Uh, so we went to some uh, pre-K facilities that are trying to address this topic. You know, they have uh, worms and they are like uh, growing vegetables so kids can be like more close to this because they don't even get dirt so <laughs> it is problem when you only have like street and that's it um, <coughs> okay psychology so sometimes we try you you can always talk to children you have the opportunity but not always but sometimes researchers do that job for you so this is a really long study that a uh, Chilean researcher did on nine years old. Uh, so she find out something like really concerning. The title is the problem of being big. So uh, we, ha we had this idea that children like, they look up for their parents and teachers and said, I want to be like them. And now it's not like that. So what they say in these conversations is like, you know, I think adulthood kind of sucks. So <laughs> I just want to be at wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah, in fact they're not. <laughs> they've just gotten smarter. <laughs> exactly. So they were like, explaining to this researcher that they they can see they, they didn't want to grow up. So they and they f and they feel like uh, they are being pushed to grow up so fast. 
because of the school education system. So it was it was kind of sad, but you know, uh, in the way that children talk and explain stuff, you know, it's at the same time like they had this innocence. It is funny, and you just put the quotes, you know. So I think it's really good, like have that perspective on children. And of course, you have the researcher that, that is giving you uh, some analysis and feedback. Uh, okay, so this is more like public policy education. So this is something that hasn't been published yet. I just have the design, which makes me a little upset. Um, <laughs> what happened is that Chile has, has done a lot of investment on college and secondary and primary education, they are doing some big changes, which why I think that mostly good, but uh, preschool education is something that we are in depth. So uh, every expert will say, now is the moment to dive in in this. This is, this is like the most urgent. Most ex expert will say, we should have started like from here and then to the other levels, <laughs> which it sounds like completely sense. And so they are, a lot of change that I have been doing now. I mean, I, I are starting this year. Uh, my editor is waiting because it is supposed that the government is going to make some announcements. So, so he wants to like, you know, be on time, obviously. And the, the poor article is waiting there. And also my money. Uh, <laughs> 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 so science, well, I love to do science articles. Uh, we, we had like a huge polemic about we, for like two years, we keep like our summertime during winter, you know? It's always like some kind of discussion about, you know, nobody likes to change hours because it is a problem to your brain, you know? You're going to sleep one hour, you lose one hour, you won one hour, whatever. So a lot of parents w agree with this because they were complaining that they were taking uh, their children to school, like two, it was like all dark, uh, the, the children were like falling asleep in the car, you know, it, it was like a bad idea. So we wonder, okay, so what will be the ideal schedule for kids to go to school, you know? Um, what we find out is kind of surprising because there is not one answer. There are a lot of answers depending on the kid's age. So for example, really young children should go maybe 8 a.m., 9 a.m., but for teenagers, because of the way their brain works, they should start like about 10, 11. <laughs> because they can help to be, so if you have teenage uh, kids, you should know that they really can't help to stay at night. So their brain needs to do that. Why? I don't know, but they need it. So uh, we try to put that evidence, uh, you know, show that and also show what happens to kids when they go to early to school because they don't work fine, you know, they are not learning at 8 a.m. Um, uh, okay, so the question of this table was, uh, can you bring uh, ECD to every bit? Again, this is like my sign, I'm not completely sure, but I'm sure, I mean, this is a, a room full of really smart journalists, so I think that you're going all going to get away to do it. Uh, and I think that the reason of that is one, you know, children are everywhere, even when sometimes we don't know them, <laughs> you know? Uh, and I think, I hope, people care. I mean, people care, mostly people care, uh, maybe in different ways. Maybe some people are going to be care like more my children, not the other one children, I know. But that is a way to start, uh, to get in to that people's mind. Um, so I think it is a uh, good, and I quote good, because it's, it's, it's not good what is happening, but I think the contingency is giving, giving us uh, possibility and we have to use that possibility. Uh, so that picture over there is from the march from yesterday on DC. But that one is from last year um Chile. And you can see that behind is our government palace, La Moneda, the coin. <laughs> uh, so we have this uh, I have talked a lot of time about this. We have a, like a huge crisis with our uh, uh, childhood care system. So a lot of people are marching and saying that we are like torturing kids in orphanage and foster care. So like four months after I came, uh, we published this. I was like uh, pushing my editor, really, four months. They're saying, you know, this is happening in Chile. We need to do a special feature. Like, give me the chance. It's going to be so good. Uh, and she was like, no, 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 no. And then she, the truth, she went out on 
vacations. <laughs> <laughs> and said, no, it's my chance. And I don't know. I, 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 <laughs> You you have to take that you have to take every chance you have. <laughs> that is the that is my main uh, observation. And I don't know how can I get out of here. I wanted to show you some of the beaches really quick. I don't know. Can you help me? Yeah. So because I wanted to show you, we did like all the publication of that week just about this. So it was like such a great opportunity. And if you could read it, you will know that all the things that we have been talking here are in here. How long was her vacation? Uh, <laughs> about two you. weeks. Oh. She no, she, I mean, <laughs> so I think she got tired. So she told me like, you know, okay, I trust you. You can do whatever you want because, uh, you know, so it was, we, we have a, like a sub editor that of course was. <laughs> so we do it a lot, you know, we had, uh, we have, uh, you see infographics. We have interview with policymakers. We have this, this main story that is mostly about science, but also about policy. And we had inside stories of people. Um, we also have, okay, this is like a full story. This is something like what John Shaw was yesterday, okay? So it's a real sad story about a guy that lived, uh, that lived all his life in an orphanage. And now he's ha having an ONG that he helps other kids that are in the same condition. And you see more, info more infographics, more interview. This is uh, our teacher that works in a juvenile jail. Uh, and of course, one last thing from policy, and I need to go back. Okay, let me see. Uh, so that's it, a lot of pages. I have help, I must say, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, and for me, it was like an amazing opportunity, you know, th these guys over here, I'm going, they're going to send you emails to know at some point, hey, how are you? Are you publishing something, you know? I want to know, <laughs> and at some point you will be like, so, I don't know, <coughs> you're going to be really happy to say, yeah, I published this about what we're talking on the, on the program. So to end, this is like the end, I want to say that I know that we, we all love stories. This is from what John showed us yesterday at the Washington Post, but I think that I need to say that stories are not enough. I think there are, there are the starting point. And I think that we, because we are here and now we have more knowledge about it, we have to do like this more boring and less popular work to show the science, the policy, the work. Uh, because I have some colleagues that they do these amazing stories and everybody's talking about it on Saturday. And then you yeah, have my stories that are about science and stuff. It's like nobody's reading it. I mean, of course, I'm not that popular, and, you know, in comparison with some other colleagues. And I know that it is because of the stories, because I don't, I don't have only the stories. I have the other things. So to the end, I came this year. You know that. And this is from last year. You know, I came with my baby, so he was like a star of this thing, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> was he interviewed by everybody? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that some of the, uh, the guys took pictures with, with her like this, you know. I should have charged. But uh, <laughs> so from this amazing experience, I have four tips for you. Okay, so for me, uh, motherhood has changed the way I cover ECD. It is my soft spot, obviously, but it's also my advantage. So I think that you should have self-awareness about your own soft spots and, of course, your strengths. So how I relate? Why do I care about this topic? And how I can I use this on the benefit of my reporting? Okay. So especially for the ones that are from outside the US and especially from developing countries, we have probably a bigger job than the rest of you. Yeah, it is true. Because we need to, I will say, like download all these experts' information to our societies and our own cultures. That is a huge challenge, you will see. And it's, I mean, it is entertaining, but at the same time, it's hard. So how can I use this research on my context? Most of the guys here are going to respond uh, a lot of your question through email, but you should also free look for contrast and go to local researchers, local knowledge. You know, we have researchers in our country. Yeah, we do. So uh, we need to put that, you know, and in the conversation and do contrast. They're going to explain you things that probably the guy from Harvard didn't know about your country. Um, and of course, uh, a psychology that joined me in some interviews with small kids tell me one thing. I know that John addressed uh, almost everything about interviews yesterday, but I want to say to you that you should more 
play more with the kids and do less interview. It, it is just quick advice. It works really good. And if you have children, it's going to be like really easy for you to play with them. You know, it's a really good starting point. And the last thing, take care of yourselves. We haven't talked much about this, but this is like a tough topic. So you don't have to be always the tough reporter. You can get sad, you can cry. And if you do, you can take like a space. You can, I mean, after I finished that special edition I show you, I went to the therapist. You know, I have a child. Listen to those stories like really affect me. So you should do the same for yourself. Talk to your other colleagues, you know, have feedback. It is important. It is going to allow you to do a better reporting. My last, whoa, okay, this is the last one. This is, like, this is the president of Chile. I'm not gonna say my president because don't push me. Uh, <laughs> so he tweeted this thing. He's not, like, this, he's not like, like Trump, luckily, but he tweeted this thing that children are the future of Chile and that's why in our go coming government they will be first in line. They, he, he has this slogan, children's first which sounds nice, right? But I want to say to you that children are not only the future, children are here, they are the present. You know, they are persons, little human beings right now, amazing human beings. So we can think of them only by thinking about when they're going to become adults and thinking, you know, we need better workers, we need to go down on violence and delinquency, you know, you know. You, no, that, that can be the only focus. We need to think about them like right now. Right? They are uh, struggling and they are suffering today. So, okay, that's it. Thank you so much. Wow. Well, these two guys, I mean, I, I think you had ideas of what you would do, but they really did a lot of preparing in addition over the last 24 hours. So my hat's off to you for everything you pulled and put together. Uh, Jack, I know that this is your overall beat as well. Was there anything you wanted to add about your orientation and thoughts? Sure, so I think most of the uh, points, uh, two great presentations, thank you. Um, so my, my, I'm uh, also on an ECD beat, but very much from a policy perspective. Um, so as well as having to convince my editor that's interesting enough, I, I need to find a story which includes a government, which can sometimes be quite uh, challenging. I think for me, um, with all the research that we learn about in the last few days, the key thing I found, and, uh, and, I, and I, from, I get the feeling from Jenny's work especially, it's very, when you look at the headlines and you look at the work, you see that it's extremely clear what questions being asked and answered. And I think it's very easy to get stuck in the weeds of all, these, of all this research and seeing this kind of research, uh, th this kind of um, randomly control, random control trial and looking into the evidence and, and getting stuck in that. And I think for me, the best articles have been where there's been a very, very succinct question why don't men work in early childhood was one question i asked another one um why is there such a racial achievement gap from such a young age what's going on in that what's going on in the home so i think keeping it simple and not being daunted by all of the research uh, and going from that simple question to looking for the research which which works rather side and finding the right people that can answer that question and um, Annabelle, I know this is also your beat. Is would you like to add anything before we open it up to everybody else? So obviously, I mean, Jenny is my editor, so she covered what we do really well. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. But she she really did. Uh, and you know, I mean, I think she she spearheaded this whole thing. And there's, um, you know, even in the states, there's really not a lot of publications that devote these types of resources to early childhood. And when I say that's my beat and my only beat. People are usually like, wow, I, I can't believe you get to cover just that. So, um, and I understand that's not the case for most people, and so you have to kind of balance, and that's hard. Uh, but I would say, you know, what was said up here is true, which is that kids are everywhere. And before I did this, I was covering international politics, so completely different. And it turns out that e through the lens of kids, I've been able to cover lots of politics stories and lots of global stories. I've never had a problem with that. Um, and that's really because I, I think when you're looking for them, you can literally find them in any beat. Um, so, yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, so there's more that we could add, but we won't do that at this point, and especially because we're hoping you guys have your own examples or questions or needs to be shared. Is that true? Or should we keep talking? Mel? Right here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
I don't even know where to start. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> where were you? I, I, I needed you both That's in my fair. life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is mom the moment I was uh, waiting for. I thought I could do this only on the pitching, but then I want to open up yeah, for all of you. Uh, 20 years working on a newspaper, and since I became a mother, I started looking to ACD with another eyes and introduced this subject on a female magazine I wrote for. And the thing I said about the frequency, oh, uh, you are talking about kids again. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. parenting. Oh, give me another subject. So that's why I started a Facebook group to moms and reach, uh, uh, reach 7,000 women from my state and there to talk about this subject. So thank you both. I, I've written a lot of ideas to return and write about. Mm -hmm. So uh, this Madres versus Madres, yeah. uh, this I believe, do you believe it's a world wild uh, subject? <laughs> uh, yeah. Because in Brazil it's very polarized, like everything, politics and uh, football and everything in Brazil is all <laughs> this or that. So uh, do you believe there is a, this subject we can uh, not be hate by other moms? Like when I say, oh, breastfeeding, oh, attached parenting, oh, there is always some groups saying, oh, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Yeah, like, she's a hippie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you wouldn't thought that uh, people would get so passionate about motherhood, but you know, we, we are moms, you know, you're going to fight for your kid and for what you think is best for your kid. Uh, so I think, I think it is, I don't know, worthwhile, but I will say that in the places where um, social media is strong, like moms go a lot to social media to f uh, found support. Because, you know, we are in a society when you don't have so many networks for support. So Facebook pages, like Facebook groups for breastfeeding, I don't know, kind of that baby like winning and kind of that stuff. We have a lot of that in Chile. And in those places, like people, it's finding out of information, but it's also receiving some kind of, you know, I think that moms, we can be like harsh between each other, you know, it is true, it is true. And sometimes like a mom will go and post, you know, am I one year old, I know, I mean, I'm so tired to breastfeeding and I really need to cut it. So maybe I'm going to take a drug or I don't know, how can I do it? And of course, a lot of them are going to jump and uh, you know, she, uh, he's only one year old, you should at least, at least breastfeed until two, you know, that is what the, um, World uh, Health Association will say, I'm, uh, I'm just saying it to you, you know, you can do whatever you want. Uh, so it, it sounds, uh, and a lot of people told me about that article, you know, this is like stupid, you know, it, like it sounds so banal. But you know, for the moms, it was good to read it. A lot of them write to me, of course I received insults, it's true, but a lot of, a lot of moms write to me and say, you know, I, I didn't think that breastfeeding was actually that important. And now that I read on the article about the science about this stuff, I am considering to try. I know it's hard, but I really want the best for my kid. That it is the truth for all moms. Yep. And one thought just to follow on that is I'd say a global problem that was not mentioned too much yesterday where interventions have made very little difference so far is in maternal depression. Yeah. Um, and that is a cause not so much of it's, it's the suffering that the parent, men go through this too, the parent is going through and the lack of support and isolation. Then there's the impact on the child development. We see a lot of impact on speech. Uh, but also when we talk about serve and return, which always bothers me as a metaphor because it's a tennis metaphor. So if you don't, I mean, you could easily have a better football metaphor if somebody wants to throw one out, you know? But um, dribbling to each other, I don't that doesn't sound so good. But basically the idea of this back and forth growing the brain, which we've talked about the last few days, it just goes away. I mean, it's going away also with technology. The studies are showing that perhaps you're engaging with your child back and forth, but then the phone rings or you text and this interrupting this is really ruining the rhythm 
that ch children's brains need to develop. But maternal depression is a huge story that really needs reporting on everywhere because the solutions for that are just not clear and the dilemmas around whether you do medicate if you're pregnant and you're depressed, also huge questions that haven't been answered. Jenny, do you wanna say something? Hi, I would just jump into something that Jane just said about the uh, the metaphor. Uh, actually, I work for Maria Cecilia uh, Soto Vidigal Foundation, and we have worked also with Frameworks Institute to do like metaphors uh, for the Brazilian context. And by the way, serve and return. What what we use? It's not that. It's bachibola, which makes more sense in a soccer sense. Okay. It's really the way we show it. It's uh, related to soccer and was just a comment that made all the sense to me but what I was going to say uh, and thank you again for this um, panel it has been wonderful and this entire day very enlightful but uh, what I wanted to say it's also for people that are not parents like myself it is this it's amazing that you bring ECG to like every beat because it helps uh, uh, more people to see that in a different perspective. As you guys said, children are everywhere. So uh, it's easy sometimes for us to be in a bubble, like away from children. And I, I read this article a month ago about how uh, mothers that have children, they get more isolated from their friends. And I see that sometimes it happens. And sometimes for our fault, like friends that don't have children, that it's mm -hmm. difficult to you know, keep the relationship. We understand. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so it's great to have it uh, bring brought to like other beats, uh, this topic, and also because uh, the awareness, sometimes you're speaking with people that are already passionate about the topic. So when, you, when you're able to remove it from like the same people that are already talking about it, you're getting more and more advocates for the cause, so this is great. Can I just add one thing? A growth editor at Court said to me, and I was really grateful for this because I, m one of my original obsessions was the art of parenting, and I would write into these, and he would always try to help me frame the story broader than that. And he said, you know, we're all kids. Like, we were someone's kid. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's a much bigger universe, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just totally. a way of thinking about it. Awesome. Thank the, you. There's a question over here somewhere or a comment? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm interested in how folks... Um, fight against the, the jargon problem. Um, so especially I would think if you actually have a beat that's called ECD, you know, we use that as shorthand, but most um, listeners, readers, et cetera, wouldn't know what that is. And you say early child development, and that also sounds um, very narrow and kind of jargony. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a challenge to how you reframe probably every story so it doesn't sound like it's part of this narrow, even though we all are very comfortable with the shorthand at this point, that's almost dangerous because you don't want to kind of right. fall back on that. And so I'm just curious, I know, Je Jenny, your situation might be a little different because that is your only beat, but, um, but how to kind of be creative about reframing every time, you, you know, we know what we're covering, but we want to make it seem more universal and less jargony. So. I was just going to say, I, I'm sort of, I've got air cover inside the newsroom, but I still have to earn the readers. So um, I think it's actually more relevant that way. Like early childhood development isn't going to resonate with a huge number of people. So I, I honestly, the way I think about it is policies and science that support families. Uh, of course, I think the way you can sell the story is going to make a huge difference. So, for example, when I pitch a story up that involves children, I don't always use uh, children at the beginning, like the concept of children. You know, for example, with um, the lack of green areas in Santiago. So that is the thing that I try to put first. So my editor was like, yeah, I think this is important. You know, we have less parks like every time, you know, we have these huge buildings, you know, a lot of, a lot of less space. And I said, yeah, that's great. And I think this is really important for children. So then I'm going to put this. <laughs> and she was like, okay, okay, it's fine. It's fine. You know, you, f you can focus on here. And I always do that, that uh, I promise that I'm going to be on this line of writing a story. And then uh, maybe two hours after deadline, I'm going to deliver something different. So she's not going to have so much time to do my changes. I don't know. And oh. apparently her method is active deception. Yeah. yeah. 
I was going to yeah. just add one other thing to that. I, I'm trying to become totally unapologetic about the terminology I just gave you, which is I think for a long time I would have thought policies and economics and science that support families sound soft. It's not. Like, it's just not. And I can make the case for that, I think, effectively. And I think if we start making that case unapologetically, then maybe we'll get, you know, more institutional support internally and be able to put these forward as policies that matter and have real-term implications. And I, I agree with this idea that it's not all labor market. I feel like I've covered the labor market from the top down. I started covering sort of Wall Street and financial markets, and then I did education, and then I got down to ECD. I'm like the reverse of what Marta was talking about yesterday. And there is a lot, there's a real tendency to talk about sort of skills we need in schools as, you know, preparing the next, preparing the, um, next generation, you know. the labor force, right? And what, what companies need, and it's like, uh, this idea that we can maybe step back and just say human potential is relevant as well is important. And again, I think with the information we have here, we have some compelling different ways to get at it. We can go to the economics if that's what that editor needs to hear. We can go to the science. But I think the truth is like we've got a good case and we should not be apologizing for writing about these things. And getting back to um, the question before about health and science and civics, where, which was that report? It was back there, there was a report of that asset at the beginning. Um, I just wanted to mention there's another field that's growing at science base right now, and it directly relates to what we learned yesterday. And it's looking at the impact of green spaces on our health and our mental health. And so there is, there is a lot of research, a lot of it's coming out of Japan and Korea, specifically South Korea, um, that also can be pitched as a story. And then for the beat itself, often I will also pitch it as resilience. And that's resilience for all of us, because we're all implicated in it. But there's a famous study. How many people are familiar with the study that Emmy Werner did in Hawaii that's gone on for almost 50 years now, I would say. And it's where we get the statistic. You know, you saw Jack Shankoff's quote about buffering. We need that one parent. It doesn't have to be a parent. It's better, ideally, if it's a parent. But if we have one caregiver in our life as a young child, just one, it can be enough to provide the balance, the protection, and the resilience they need and we have examples of that. We had it in our previous president who really, he did have the support of his grandparents, but he said his mom really did the job with one parent. We, we know that that's the case, and so the research isn't out enough about that, and that would be uh, another way to go. I think there was one more question or yeah, comment. So I'm just sort of curious um, what kind of response you guys are receiving from like your growth editors and just readers in general, you know, I think, I work for you know a big national publication, and I think what we're finding is that we've been writing for years and years and years for men, and uh, specifically like you know fifty year old white men, and so, so so there is an active effort to recruit new readers, right, who are going to other places sometimes, which are women, and which is not to say that women are only interested in reading about, you know, children, but but that there are, that there are all of these other educated people out there who want these resources and who want to have these very smart discussions about um, families and everything. So I'm just curious uh, if you are noticing that specifically your coverage is bringing in those readers to your publications, um, and if you're just hearing that either anecdotally or actually seeing the numbers around that. We don't have any gender breakdown on our numbers, so I wouldn't know it from that standpoint. But I definitely have, um, in my first year at Quartz, I think to the surprise of many, and most definitely myself, um, my parenting stories did incredibly well. And they were generally pretty science-based stories, but really addressed very head-on kind of parenting questions. Um, and it uh, went, to the, I think there was this sense of, Quartz was very tech and science focused at the start, and so I think there was a real recognition that this was um, a topic of great interest to a lot of people. Our readers are 60-40 um, female, I think, um, and six, no, sorry, 60-40, 60% US, 40% global, I'd like 55-45 male, I think. And so I don't know how it breaks down per story, but what I know is we're getting a lot of all of those readers in all of those regions to these stories. So that is very encouraging to me. Um, and your comments about the New York Times, of course, make me laugh because I definitely know that to be true. But I also think that what's interesting is that, 
and this is to the point Joan was making about progress. I pitched to the Times five years ago a beat that was really would have hit this head on. And I can't tell you the number, like, are you kidding? You can't write stories. Like, there was just such, and now I, there's like entire sections dedicated to it. You know, almost everybody's doing it. And I don't say that to like toot my own horn. I say that to say like we've made progress as, you know, as a society and as institutions. So, and that's a good thing. Uh, I would like to add that, of course, parenting is now a huge topic. But I will give like the example for me about science. We have in Chile like a really growing science community, a lot of PhD uh, coming back from, out, from outside, you know, like young researchers that are really active on social media. So a lot of newspapers are using these kind of people to put, you know, they bring so much traffic to our websites. Uh, and I, f I, I feel very lucky that most of them trust me. So when they read a story of me, they say, Come on, you know, this is like such a great story because it has like good fundamentals. It, is, it has the good science. It's something like a serious work and they go like really viral, something that sometimes I didn't expect. So in that way, my editor, now she's happy, you know, she said, okay, this is working so you can go on. So maybe a good idea is to try to look for this community ghettos on the, on the website, on the, I mean online. Uh, because they do, because they advocate for their topics, so they are really active. So maybe that's a good idea. And one last comment, and then um, oh, back over to Bruce, is this was also in your packet, and it was the first time ever that Zero to Three had a global issue. It was edited by Joan and, and by me together, which was a wonderful experience. But just because we're on gender, we'll finish with gender. I would say of all the articles in here, it would be interesting for you to read the one that's called Changing the Global Mindset on Fathers. And it's about the men care campaign and uh, Promundo. And it really got me thinking. So we'll leave it on that note. Thank you, all three of you. Fabulous.